song, they did a good job of it. I, I, uh, I used to like summertime when I was a child. I don't understand how kids like summertime. They love to be out and go swimming, do those things. But since I've started pastoring, well, I don't, I'm not too crazy about summertime because I miss so many of my friends. Our attendance is always down in the summertime, people on vacations and whatnot. And uh, I, know the, I know the kids will hate me for saying this, but I'll be glad when school starts because everybody's back in pocket. And I just, I just love it uh, in the fall, in early winter, when I can come to Sunday school and I go downstairs and Sherry's department's just full of kids. I mean, it'll just be full of kids. And, and I miss that. And uh, we'll have that again when school starts. I enjoyed the song, and I, I enjoy it. I'm uh, proud that everyone's here. I uh, sometimes say that, uh, I'll say, well, the Lord gave me this sermon. And I'd like to correct that statement. I read something that uh, really opened my eyes about that, and that is that the Lord doesn't give sermons. What the Lord does is, is impress upon the preacher what he wants him to preach about. But it's up to the preacher to do the studying find the examples and to arrange all that information so that it can be easily understood and received and the Holy Spirit can use and bless that. And the person that wrote that, uh, they give a knowledge of a man that raises flowers. And he said all the flowers that he plants are like the studying that a minister puts into the Word of God. But it's up to the preacher then to, or the, the gardener to pick those flowers, choose the flowers, pick those flowers, put them into an arrangement so that he can set them on the dinner table for a centerpiece. And he brought out how that some are more gifted, better gardeners and more gifted in their selection and, and their arrangement than others. And they brought out something that's so true. The Lord doesn't give a sermon. If the Lord gives me a sermon, then it would be a perfect sermon. My English would be perfect. There'd never be a flaw in it. Flaw in it. But I must confess that sometimes I listen to one of the sermons that I preached, and I find faults in it. I mean, I find flaws in it. And sometimes they, they're really disturbing because I will say something in a sermon, and I intend to clarify what I just said, and I fail to do that. And then I'll listen to that tape, and I'll go, oh, I didn't explain what I meant. And unfortunately, I'm afraid that misleads people as to what I'm saying or what I, do, I believe. But if I've done my homework, I pray that this sermon will be a blessing to you. When God impressed it upon me, it was a blessing to me. And I hope I've done my homework. I hope that I've arranged it in such a way that it will be a blessing to you. It's something I feel that we all need occasionally. Brother Wade said, pointed to Marion. and Marion didn't sing, but he pointed to Marion and said, preach to Marion this morning. Because I kind of pick on them sometimes. But I, I hope I do preach to you this morning, and I hope I preach to all of you this morning. And I, and I hope that when you leave, you can say, I'm glad I belong to the Lord. And if you don't belong to the Lord when you leave, I hope you're saying, I wish I did belong to the Lord. And I hope when you leave, there's no excuse for you not belonging to the Lord. Turn, if you will, to Hebrews. We've been studying on Sunday nights in Hebrews, and this is kind of a continuation of our study in the sixth chapter last Sunday night, we studied the first part of the sixth chapter. And I want to take my text from the last part of the sixth chapter. And I want to preach on a strong consolation. God's strong consolation. And I know how we humans are. I know sometimes we get down and we have things that that really bothered us. I know I do, and I, I know that there's times when you do, and, and sometimes I feel like we just take life too serious. I really do. You know, when you stop and consider, we're only going to be here for just a little while. We're just going to be here for a little while. If I live to be 100, it's just a little while compared to eternity. But I'm so, so thankful that God, even though He leaves us here for a little while, He's a loving God, and He gives us strong consolations. On Wednesday night, we've been studying. We've been studying in the Psalms, and last Wednesday night, I I thought of something that I shared with the church. The fact that David did not die with his boots on. David died an old man, and he died still king, and he died in bed. Now God did not see fit to reveal to David when he was a young shepherd boy 
there on the hillside or as a young, a young man slain Goliath, God did not show him his end. God did not take him ahead in time and show him that he would die at a good old age, still king, and die peaceably in his own bed. The reason God didn't is because David went through a lot of trials in his life. As we will go through a lot of trials in our life. But every one of those trials made David just a little stronger. Just a little stronger. And the purpose of the trials is that we might learn to lean on, learn to trust Jesus. That's the purpose of the trials that we go through is to try our faith and help us to realize that you can't make it on your own. You've got to have God. One time on television, they were interviewing some young people, and one, a young lady there, a young teenager, and, and you know, I don't mean this to show disrespect, but most teenagers really don't know all that much. You know, uh, ours do, they're, but they're very unusual. But most teenagers, that boy, they'll, you know, they think they know everything, you know, but... They were interviewing him concerning religious young teenager. Young teenage girl said, I don't need religion. All religion is is a crutch. You know, she thought, boy, she'd really sound something, said something profound. You know, that's true. <laughs> that's what God is, is a crutch because we're weak. I need God. Now, when you're 15 or 16, maybe you don't think you do, but I'll tell you what, when the storms come, when the trials come, you'll find that you need God. And all these trials is to help us and make us realize we need God and that He is a God that can be trusted. And so therefore God does not reveal to us the end of the journey. We would love it because if you belong to Him, everything's going to turn out right. But we still got to walk by faith. We have to walk by faith. But God did choose to give us strong consolation. Now, here's what I mean by that. You see, God could save you and not give you one scripture that would give you assurance of your salvation and still keep you and take you to glory. Now, I hope I made that clear. In the scriptures, God gives us a lot of assurance and consolation that God saves us, God keeps us. But I'm saying he didn't have to give us that assurance in scripture and still accomplish that. You see, he could have saved you, but not told you that he's going to keep you saved. You'd still wound up in the glory land. But you see, you'd have a lot of anxious moments down here. But the Father God chose not only to save you, but is constantly reassuring you that He will keep you. Don't worry. He's in control. Unlike the old song that we sing, life is like a mountain railroad. Keep your hand upon the throttle and your eye upon the rail. I'll tell you what, I'm glad I'm not driving the train. I derail it. But you see, life is not like that. Jesus is our captain. He will not derail the train. It is not a salvation by works. But God chose to give us a strong consolation. Now, let me read, if you will, the sixth chapter of Hebrews. I'll begin with the 16th verse. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Now what that means is, especially during that day, I suppose during that day a man's word was worth something. If men would get in an argument over something, if a man would swear that he's telling the truth, then that ended the argument. And it says men always swear by the greater, and that's true. You know, we'll say, I swear on my daddy's grave, or I'll swear on the Bible. See, men swear by the greater. Now, we know that we're not to swear. The Bible tells us we're not to swear because we cannot control our destiny. But nevertheless, it says men verily swear by the greater. And an oath for confirmation is a, to them an end of all strife. The battle ceases once someone swears that he'll do something or has done something. Wherein God willing more abundantly 
to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability. That means the unchangeableness. The unfailing of his oath, of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. That by two unchangeable things. Now the unchangeable things is first of all, God gave us a promise. He cannot go back on his word. And then to seal that, he confirmed it with an oath. And since there is no greater, he swore on his own name that he would bring to pass certain things. That by two unchangeable or immutable things in which it was not possible for God to lie. Now why did he do all this? He didn't have to do this. But God loves us. And he doesn't want us to go through life fretting and worrying. God did this that we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Now what's he saying? He's saying God loves those that have accepted Jesus as his Savior. Now we know, know he loves the whole world, but he loves us because we are in the Beloved. And because he does, God went to the, went to the trouble of giving a promise, then swearing an oath so that you people that have been born again might have a strong consolation, that you might have assurance. Who's that go out to? Those that have laid hold upon the hope set before us. Now, who are those people? Those that have trusted in Jesus. You see, Jesus is the only hope you have. And they're out of all humanity. There has always been a remnant that has laid hold upon that hope that has been set before us. By faith, we lay hold upon that hope. And since we have, God says, I want you to have assurance I want you to know that I not only saved you, but I will keep you. And you see, that is the, so that we'll have a strong consolation. You know, I know people probably get tired when I say, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. But I don't care when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Not because Jerry Dobbs said it, but because God gave a promise, confirmed it with an oath, and I have a strong consolation because I've laid hold upon that hope that was set before me. I have Jesus Christ in my heart and the Holy Spirit has sealed me into the day of redemption. So therefore I can say I have a strong consolation. I have assurance. And the Father all through the scriptures is constantly giving us that strong consolation. And not only in covenants and in promises and oaths, but by his word. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give unto them what? Eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Amen. Yeah, but I am. A, you know, isn't it amazing? One time my dad asked me a question. He says, Jerry, why can't people understand that? And I said, Daddy, they do understand it. They just don't believe it. That is not hard to understand. Friend, eternal means it will never end. And that's the kind of life Jesus gives you. Eternal life. And he says you will never perish. And in the Greek, that word is never throughout the ages. End world without end. That's what it means. Now that takes it a long time. That's long enough. Never is long enough. But yet they say, yeah, but. You know, they always add a yeah, but on the end of it. Everything Jesus says, they'll always add a yeah, but on it. Did you ever know that? Yeah, yeah, but. I know they said that, yeah, but. See, why don't we just believe God? Why can't we just take his word and believe it? What does he, John also said? He says, all that the Father giveth me and all that he giveth me shall come unto me and I will in no circumstances cast them out. Yeah, but. Yeah, but. And he says, this is the Father's will. All that believeth on me, I will raise up at the last day. Yeah, but. But I don't find that in there. I don't know. Maybe I got the wrong one. I'm reading King James. I don't know what they got, but there's got a lot of yeah but in it. 
My, I'm just going by what God says. It doesn't make any difference what my opinion is. It doesn't make any difference what your opinion is. The only thing that matters is thus saith the Lord. And he said, all the Father giveth me shall come to me. And all that cometh unto me I will in no case, under no circumstances, cast them out. Aren't you glad? Amen. Look what else he says in Romans. If you would, now I haven't got to my sermon yet, but turn to Romans if you will. Eighth chapter. I'm going to begin with the 32nd verse. Now, if this doesn't cover everything, would someone please tell me what he left out? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Now here's what he said. If God loved you enough to give the most precious thing he had, his son to die on an old rugged cross, won't he do whatever else it takes to keep you? If he give you the best thing he had, isn't he going to give you any lesser gift to keep you? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifies. Who is he that condemneth? It's Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Now look at verse 38. Paul says, For I am persuaded. Now you may not be persuaded, and there's a lot of people that aren't persuaded. Uh, I was talking to a man yesterday where he works. There's some people of another persuasion and, and they're saved by feeling. In other words, if they feel saved, they feel secure. And if they don't, well, they don't. You know, it's one of them kind of days where God loves me today, but he doesn't tomorrow. And See, what? Because they don't go by the word. They go by feeling. And that's a very dangerous and insecure ground to stand on. Anyway, this man was, runs the sound room, and there at church he said that day he just didn't feel like God loved him. He just really felt unlovable. But he said after church he come out, and there was a man there who said, Brother, I love you. And he said, Then I knew that God loved me. Well, I could have told him that before the guy said anything about it. The Bible declares that God loves him. See, I would rather go on the Word because my feelings change. I don't always feel loved. Praise God, I know that I am because God says that he loves me. Now notice something. He said, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities, that means a demonic principalities and demonic powers, nor things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Yeah, but I don't understand that. Yeah, but, yeah, but. I heard somebody say, yeah, but you can. You can get yourself out. Well, what kind of creature are you? He says no other creature. What does that make you? If you can take yourself out of God's care, out of his hand, then you're a weird kind of creature. And why would you want to? See? Listen, if you did want to, it'd just be Satan. It'd just be Satan in you. Isn't that right? Listen, God's already defeated Satan. God wants you to have a strong consolation. Now, let me, let me tell you what happens. One thing that really upsets me when people say, I'll be talking to somebody and they say they're saved and well, praise God. Boy, isn't that great when we get over it. Then they say, well, I hope I make it. I hope I make it. Now, you, now doesn't that sound humble? That sounds humble, isn't it? Listen, that's not humility. That's a sin of the worst kind. Do you know what they're doing when they say, I hope I make it? They're saying, God can't be trusted. They're saying, I don't know whether I can trust God or not. They're calling God a liar to his face. That is not humility. That is the worst kind of sin when people say, I hope. I hope. All right, it's either that or something ever, ever bit as bad. Either they don't believe God, they don't trust God, or it comes from another area that's just as bad and just as demonic. They're trying to establish their own righteousness. So therefore what they're saying is, I hope my righteousness is good enough. See, 
It's got to be one of the two. Either they don't believe God or they're trusting in their own righteousness. Now, the Apostle Paul in the 10th chapter of Romans said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. He said, For I bear them record they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. They're ignorant. He said, For they, going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves into the righteousness of God. Now, that word establish means to prop up. Means to set up. Like you would set a statue up. See, They're trying to get their own righteousness to stand. It keeps falling over. Hey, any of you people try to establish your own righteousness, you'll find it keeps falling over. Whoop, there it goes again. Ka-flop. And so they say, well, if I take a little religion, I can prop it up with that. So they'll go join a church or get baptized. Stick it under there and the thing's top heavy and it falls over again. Just like old Dagon before the Ark of the Covenant. You remember when the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant, which is representative of God's glory. And the Philistines brought it in in the garden there and set it before Dagon. Next morning they got out and old Dagon had just flopped right over head first in front of the Ark. They, what'd they do? What'd they do? They didn't say, whoa, the God of Israel, he is Lord. They didn't do that. They just propped him up again. Next morning they come in there and he fell off and broke his head off and his hands off. Nothing left but the stump. But that's the way people do. They're always propping their righteousness up. You know, a lot of rich people, they give a lot of money to charity, see, for propping up their righteousness. Isn't that something? Now the old Pharisees, see, and not only that, they have a zeal. It said those Jews had a zeal. Man, I mean, they worked at it. Man, I get this righteousness and all up there just right where God don't accept it. Boy, and I get it just right and they back off the thing just... Did you ever do that? Here's what I've done before. You be holding a board up and you need to nail it and your hammer's over here, see? We've all done something similar to this. And you think, if you, you know, you don't want to turn loose the board, so you go, I catch you trying to grab that hammer before the board falls over, you know? You reach down here and the board starts to fall. Well, you got to do something. You got to give up on it. That's the way men do with their righteousness. They get it all propped up, you know, just right. And then they back up and say, whoops, starting to fall again. Better pray a little more. Give a little more money. Maybe if, I be, maybe if I teach a Sunday school class, let's see if that, whoop, that didn't work either. Men's trying to establish their own righteousness. Prop up their own righteousness. And I want to tell you something, that won't work anyway. Did you know if you could get your own righteousness to stand, I don't care how pure it is, you could be just as holy. I mean, you could just walk in the door and just glisten. You know, I mean, you could just glow. You could be, that won't work. You know why? Because the Bible says, by the deeds of the flesh. No, by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight. And you see, if you could be, if, if you could, if you could be good enough, if you could be righteous enough, Paul says, well, that won't work because God has designated another way, and that's through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. See, Peter says, wherefore the rather, brethren, there's no other name given whereby men must be saved. You can be as good as you want to, and that is not going to get you in glory. But you see, there's a lot of Christians think that God saved us by grace, but we keep ourselves by our works. But listen, that's not a new thing. That's not a new thing. Galatians did the same thing. Paul wrote to the Galatian church and said, Oh, foolish Galatians. He said, You're so foolish. He said, Have you begun in the Spirit, and now you're going to be perfected by the flesh? In other words, you think God's going to save you by grace, but you're going to keep yourself saved by establishing your own righteousness. Isn't it amazing how many people, boy, they'll come to the altar and they'll get on their knees and they'll cry and they'll moan and yes, God gloriously save me. Now, boy, walk that straight and narrow because, whoo, I'm lost if I don't. See, look, when God, listen, you didn't have enough power to save yourself and you don't have enough power to keep yourself. Salvation is of the Lord. And that's what he's trying to say. And in Hebrews, that's the reason he says, I want to give you a strong consolation. I want those that have trusted in Jesus to have the assurance and know that I save and I keep. The Lord is my name. I am Savior and there's none other beside me. Friend, you're, you're not Savior. On the Lord is Savior. He's the only one who can save you and he's the only one that can keep you. Now, Paul goes on into the new covenant. And I'm so thankful for the new covenant. And you know why I'm thankful for the new covenant? Because there was flaws in the old one. And the apostle Paul in Hebrews is going to tell us that. So now I'll get down to my sermon. Turn to Hebrews.
Let's go to the 8th chapter now, on the 6th verse. 8th chapter, 6th verse. Paul here is getting ready to explain the new covenant. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, speaking of Christ. Now, don't worry about that because we're studying the Hebrews and we'll get to that and I'll explain the first part of the verse when we get to it. But primarily, I want to deal with the last half of this verse. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of what? A better covenant which was established upon better promises. Now he gives the difference between the two covenants, law and grace. For if that first covenant, the Mosaic covenant, had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. In other words, if the first covenant worked, you wouldn't need a second one. By the way, why didn't it work? Does anybody know why it didn't work? Because they broke it. You see, the Mosaic Covenant was conditional. God said, I will do this if you will do that. Well, God did his part, but the Jews didn't do their part. They broke the covenant. There was nothing wrong with the covenant. The problem was in, we are sinners. That's the reason you cannot be saved under the Mosaic Covenant. People are still trying to keep themselves saved under the Mosaic Covenant. It didn't work then, it won't work now, and it won't work tomorrow. That's the reason we had to have the New Covenant. And I want to show you the New Covenant. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, Paul here is quoting Jeremiah thousands of years before. Jeremiah said, this covenant ain't going to hack it. He said, God's going to give a new covenant. You Jews are breaking the old one. There's nothing wrong with it. You broke it. You can't, you're not keeping it. You can't ever be saved under that covenant. But God, he said, the days come when God will give you a new covenant. And do you realize when Jesus died on the cross, when he... When he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. When he gave up the ghost, it says that the veil was rent from top to bottom. The old dispensation ended. The old covenant passed away. And it, that's when it literally passed away. Now, about five years after this writing is when they came in and they destroyed the temple, the altar, and everything. And since then, they've not had animal sacrifice. I mean, that dispensation was done away. Now, let's notice what happened. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, who did he make the covenant with? Not the Gentiles. A lot of people think he made the covenant with the church. He didn't make the covenant with the church. God never made covenants with Gentiles. He always made the covenants with Israel, with his covenanted people, Israel. But Gentiles can enter into that covenant by faith and partake of it. It's always been that way. Did you know what? Provision had always been made that a, that a Gentile could be saved. Did you know that? All he had to do was come in, to, come in there and say, I want to be a Jew, and he'd have to submit himself to all their ordinances and circumcision and all that. He had to become a Jew. They called him proselytes. And he had to do that, and he could be saved just like a Jew. All right, now God gives Israel a new covenant and we Gentiles are saved by faith entering into that covenant. Now, once we enter in by faith, then we are the what? Spiritual seed of Abraham. But you see, when the Jews broke this covenant, God didn't do away with them. Why? Because in Exodus, the 19th chapter 6 verse, he had already made a covenant and he said, ye shall be a holy nation and ye shall be kings and priests unto me. And that was before he gave the law. Now, the breaking of the commandments uh, does away with the blessings of the covenant, but not the covenant. That's the reason God's people, the Jews, are always his people and always will be. And in the end time, he will bring them back in because he made an unconditional covenant with them. Now, when they, they broke the laws of the covenant, they lost the blessings. If they were obedient, they received the blessings. If they broke them, they did away with the blessings. Now notice.
Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Because they continue not in my covenant, I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. All right, now here's the difference. You see, under the Mosaic law, the laws were written on tablets of stone. But he said, under the new dispensation, under the new covenant, I'll write them on their hearts. Write them on their hearts. How many here the saved knows when you do wrong? Well, of course you do. I don't have to go say, wait a minute, I've got it written down somewhere. I better check this. No, I'm all right. Uh-oh, I goofed it. No, it's a better covenant because it's internal. It's internal. The other one was external. And all the blessings under the other covenant were temporal. See, God said, if you will keep my laws and my statutes, I will bless your land. I will make you fruitful. Your cattle will increase. Your children will increase. I will send the rain in its season. And boy, you're going to have it good and the land's going to flow with milk and honey. Now that was the Mosaic Covenant. But if you disobey, man, your land's going to dry up. Your crops ain't going to do good and you're going to go into captivity. And that's exactly what happened to them. But now keep in mind, it was conditional. He said, if you will do this, I will do this. But under the new covenant, it's not conditional. God just says, here's what I'm going to do for you. He says, I'm going to write my laws in your mind and in your heart. And he says, I will be unto you a God. Now, you know what that means? A father God. Now, we can't understand that because we've had it good so long. A father God. He said, I will have the relationship with you as a father does his child, in other words. Listen, a little child will run right up to his daddy and climb up on his lap. See, under Mosaic law, Jew did not have access to God. Man, he trembled before God. He stood back from God. God was holy. He was unapproachable. But under the new covenant, he said, I'll be a, a father God to you. And you'll be my people, my people. Is there anybody here that's partial to their own children or their own grandchildren? I'm the only one. You know, I love all little kids, but I really love my grandkids. I love all little kids, but I really love my grandkids. They're mine. See, God says, I will be your God, and you shall be my people. Isn't that great? Man, listen, God really loves you. Now, he loves the world. He's, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son to die. And he loves the sinner, but he loves him different than he does his kids. Boy, he really loves his kids. Now, Father, he's your protector. He's your provider. That's all in the new covenant. But that's not all. Under the law, when you sinned, God took note. You was a lawbreaker. You were a sinner. You were guilty. You were under the death sentence. You must bring a lamb. And it must be sacrificed. Look at the new covenant. Now, I don't want to get down to it right yet. Look at verse 11. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. That means all the saved. That doesn't mean all mankind. Now, what does it mean to know the Lord? Well, you can know him in an intimate way. I don't have to tell you how lovely the Lord is. You know that. You've experienced that. He lives in your heart. Under the law, like Job said, he said, you know, he said uh, he always loved God and he thought of God and all that. And he said, I'd always heard about him with the ear. But now I've seen him face to face. It's all together different. And you see a lot of people are just wrapped up in religion. They don't know God. They know God's love because somebody told them he's love. But those that know him know he's love. They know him intimately. He's our father. Christ is our brother. We're members of the family. And I don't need to tell you about your brother. You know your brother. I don't need to tell you about your father. You know your father. And it says all from the greatest to the least shall know him. You know, it's great to see, see a, an old man that's walked years and years and years with the Lord. And he'll give you his experiences that he's had. But you can talk to a little child that's just been saved a week or two. And listen, saying, oh, how I love Jesus, or Jesus loves me, this I know. They know the Lord. See, from the greatest to the least, they know the Lord. That's part of the new covenant. And notice this. 
For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. You don't find that in the old covenant. God took note of every one of them. But you see, when you're saved, you're his child. And he said, I'll remember them no more. Why? Why not? Because Jesus has already paid for them. You've been washed in the blood. Isn't that great? You know, a lot of times Christians feel guilt over something that's happened years ago in the past. And you know what? God said, I've already forgot it. Now, why do you want to hang on to it? God's already forgot it. He's already forgiven it. He don't remember it anymore. So don't hang on to it. Quit hanging on to it. I want to tell this story. I've still got a little bit of time, but I want to tell this story about a, a man that adopted a little boy. And this little boy was an orphan. I mean, you talk about poor. He was poor. Poor little ragged kid. His friend come to see him and he was saying, this is my new little son I've adopted. And boy, he was all dressed up in a new suit and new pair of shoes. And, oh, he looked nice. And the man said, uh, this is my new little son. We adopted him. But he said, I want to show you what he looked like when we got him. So he went to the closet and he took out the raggedest old pair of shoes you ever saw. I mean, the soles come off, the tops was worn out, the wasn't these shoestrings, the tongue was hanging out like it'd give up the ghost. It was terrible. And the man said, you know, I keep these old shoes. And when he gets out of line, I show him these old shoes to remind him what I've done for him. And his friend said, I'm sure glad God don't keep my old shoes. You see, when God saved you, he forgave you. He got rid of your old shoes. He gave you the robe of righteousness. And he don't remember your past anymore. Isn't that great? That's the new covenant. And do you notice what he said here? Now notice, I want to read this to you again. I just want to read this covenant. And I want you to, I want you to see if there's anything he told you you to do to keep the covenant. Now we could go back to the Mosaic covenant and I'll show you what God said you had to do to keep the covenant. But look at the new covenant. It doesn't say you do anything other than enter in by faith. Lay hold of the hope set before you. Notice. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. God said, I'll do all these things. Now, see, in the Old Covenant, there was no forgetting and there was no forgiveness. A lot of people don't realize it. God didn't forgive them, and so therefore he didn't forgive their, forget their sins. They were only covered. When a person brought the lamb, their sins was only passed over from one year to the next. And they did this all their life. Every year they brought their sacrifice, and God didn't forgive it. He didn't forgive their sin. He didn't forget their sin. But it was just passed over another year. Eventually that man died and their sins were just covered. They were just passed over. But when Jesus went to the cross, then he paid for and took out of the way every sin that was ever committed. See, he died for the sins of the whole world, not just this dispensation. But he died for Adam's sin. He died for Eve's sin. He died for every sin that was ever committed. But under the new covenant, we have instant forgiveness. The moment you come to Christ, I don't care what you've done in the past, the moment you come to Christ, you have instant forgiveness. And the, listen, I don't have the power to forget. I don't seem to have the power to remember either. I can't remember very much. But you do something wrong to me and I might forgive you, but I don't forget it. I might want to, and I don't hold it against you, and I don't try to get even, but still, it's always there in the back of my mind. I remember what he did. There was one bowl of ice cream left, and he knew I wanted it, but he ate it anyway. See, I never forget that. But God has the ability and the power to forgive and at the same instant blot it out of his memory. Isn't that great? That's the new covenant. Now, let's go back to Hebrews. Let's go back to the text. And I'll close very shortly. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. 
wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise. See, he wants you to know. He wants you to know you're secure. More abundantly to show into the heirs of of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, who we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Do you know what he's saying there? Before you be lost, it'd have to jerk God off the throne because the anchor reaches right to the throne of God. It's anchored to God himself. And God says, I want you to have this assurance. Now, he's going to get you there whether you believe it or not. In other words, as long as you're trusting Jesus. But why go doubting? Why not believe his word? Why not rest in the assurance that he gives you? Now you say, well, why not? What difference does it make if I'm going to get there anyway? And I want to tell you why. Because if Satan can convince you that you can be lost after you're saved, you're not going to be a very happy Christian. Now you think about it. You're not going to be a very happy Christian. When you go to your workplace, you're not going to be witnessing for God. You're too busy trying to keep yourself saved. Does that make sense? That when you go to work and you're saved and you know you're saved and God's going to keep you, then you've got something to share with your co-workers. One time at Grove, Oklahoma, this is years and years ago, they were, the government was giving away free land. They'd give you like five acres, but you had to make improvements on it. And you had like five years to make a certain amount of dollars worth of improvements because if you didn't, then the government would take the land back. And my dad asked my Uncle Jess, he said, Said, Jess, something I want to know. Said, all this free land the government's giving away. Said, all I ever see built on it is just shacks. I never see anybody building a nice house. Why is that? It says, well, they don't really trust the government. And they don't want to build too much on there in case the government jerks a rug out from under them. They don't want to lose what they put on it. And you see a lot of people the same way about salvation. Well, I'm not going, I want to work enough to keep saved, but boy, what if God don't keep his work? And then I've wasted my whole life. So I don't know, I believe I'd rather go to the lake. I believe I don't know what I want to do. Boy, I want to do just enough maybe to get in, but yet I want, see? But listen, if God saves you, you know it's yours, you know God's salvation, he's given it to you and he's going to keep you, then you can just get in there and serve him. Because I'm going to tell you what, he said, even if you give a cup of cold water in my name, you'll not lose your reward. Anything you do for Jesus, listen, he won't let you down. But now who has this strong consolation? Those who have laid hold upon the hope set before them. But I want to tell you something. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I can't give you any consolation. There's none in the Bible. You can read it all the way through. God has no consolation. He has no comforting word for you. All I've got for you is doom and woe. But if you want this consolation, if you want to know a God that will be your Father, and you'll be his son. And he'll forgive your sins. And he'll forget your sins. And he will save you and keep you. Then we're going to give you an image.